Welcome everyone to the launch of Lockdown Wales by Will Hayward, which is an, a very timely uh, examination of the coronavirus pandemic in Wales. It's a book of two halves to um, take the, uh, the football analysis even further. Um, in the first part, it provides a narrative of the, um, the first lockdown in Wales in all its oddness and its you know, the horror and the occasional humour. And in the second half, it explores in more depth the various issues that the pandemic threw up, uh, both in Wales and in the UK. Things like PPE and care homes and testing and devolution. And um, as an aside, awful vocabulary, right? Ramping up. Um, it's a subject which has got a lot of people hot under the collar. Um, but I think one of the virtues of Lockdown Wales is it takes a step back and it gathers, gathers its thoughts about the bigger picture. And this is important. I mean, having read this afternoon on the BBC Wales News website, the comments about Wales' um, current rise in cases, it's clear um, that we need a lot more looking at the bigger picture and a lot less short-term point scoring. And that's one of the reasons actually a long time ago, back in March, April, when Will and I first spoke about the book that I, want, I wanted to publish a book about the pandemic because like Will, I wanted to, something that offered an alternative to the kind of mind numbing and, and also corrosive now, now, now of um, social media and, and some online journalism. And I think it'd be a tragedy really if the pandemic was used to advance kind of false agendas by politicos and, and would be politicos of which there are so many these days. But sermon over, I mean, why listen to me when you can be listening to Will and to Sandra Loy, who's kindly agreed to lead the discussion tonight. So over to you, Sandra. Nick, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and to you all for having me here this evening. Uh, it's Will's evening, so he's going to be taking up, well, the spotlight's going to be on him this evening, let's put it that way. I'll be, for reasons of transparency, let's make it clear, Will, we were work colleagues several years ago, weren't we? Yeah, we were. Now we are work neighbors. <laughs> let's, um, let's start then by rolling back the clock to March 2020, a time that I think it's fair to say is going to be ingrained on the collective memory of everybody for a long, long time to come. Now, at that time, you had been enjoying a particularly successful spell as social affairs correspondent at Wales Online, done very, very well for yourself. You were about to, however, embrace change because you accepted the role of acting political editor. So it was clear a bit of change was on the horizon. Nobody knew exactly how much change was on the horizon because at almost precisely that time, of course, the wheels fell off the world, didn't they? Um, our lives started to change, the whole world started to change, your life and job changed massively at that point. Just tell us a little bit about that baptism of fire and what exactly went on in those early days, weeks, months. Oh God, well, firstly, hello everyone. Um, I can see like five of you at a time, so um, I'm, I'm hoping there's still everyone else left. Um, <laughs> So I think it's it's bizarre. Back in February, uh, Paul Rowland, who's um, the uh, editor in chief um, at Media Wales, where I work, said that uh, Ruth, who was the political editor, would be going on maternity leave for 12 months. And did I want to take over for, for that year? And we had a chat in February about the sort of stuff we'd want to cover. And I think we probably talked about three or four other things before we discussed how we talk about coronavirus. And that was that was in February. Um, and uh, we didn't realize we thought it might be a story but we had no idea it would be the story um and really the only story that would be dominating not just news but just all our lives um it was it was surreal i remember before we went um well we had to start working from home uh we were all in the newsroom watching um some uh now uh, quite infamous press conferences um and um where words like herd immunity and stuff were mentioned and um I remember uh, e even when we were going into lockdown and we were told we're not going to work at the office anymore, it still seemed 
it still seemed quite surreal. Um, Martin Shipton, who uh, is actually on this call, is my desk mate um, at uh, Wales on Hine. And uh, as I left, um, I said I was carrying out my um, two screens to uh, work from home. And I said, oh, I'll uh, catch you later, Martin. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'll see you at the Christmas party. And we, we laughed quite a lot about that because yeah, obviously we're going to be back by Christmas. That was crazy. We didn't realise that there wouldn't actually be a, we wouldn't have a Christmas party even. Um, and when I spoke to Paul about taking over in the role, he was like, oh, make the most of this, you know, go to, go to Downing Street, go and try and get into some champagne receptions, you know, really make the most of this role. And little did I know that from the day I started on the 1st of April, I would be in this spot right here. This is where the entirety of the job has been done. Um, I, I've mixed it up a bit. I used to sit facing that way, but um, it uh, has all been pretty much right here. So, uh, yeah, I don't think um, I, I really, uh, it wasn't anything like I expected, but um, it's, um, and it seems like we'll probably be going back just as I finish this role. So uh, it's been, uh, it's been surreal. Was there, I often wonder, and I'm sure all of you are in the same position, I often wonder what, what was the moment when we first became aware of this virus and, and it first um, was on our radars? Can you remember the moment for you, Will, when you, when you first heard about it? Um, well, it was in January. Um, there was a, a conversation, well, there was a debate in the Senate about this new respiratory virus that had appeared in um, Wuhan province and they were discussing, did we have enough PPE, um, for instance? And, uh, um, uh, you know, were people, uh, should we be putting in travel restrictions? And it was all, it was all just something that couldn't happen to us, which I, I don't, I mean, even up until March, people were, we'd do a story on, oh, there's been four more coronavirus cases in Wales and I'd get so many messages and people going, ah, oh, stop scaremongering. Like only one person's died. More people have died in car crashes this year. And I don't think we quite, I think we heard about it very early, but I don't think it really clicked how big it was until March at the very earliest. Um, unless of course you're an epidemiologist, in which case probably early January, you were thinking, oh God, why is no one taking this seriously? So it felt like, someone else's problem almost didn't it for a long time I think for all of us I think I think we'd agree that it won't happen here it won't happen to, to us that that kind of mentality absolutely I, I think um I mean we'd seen it we've seen uh, viruses and diseases uh, a lot we've seen SARS we've seen uh, MERS we've seen Ebola we've seen swine flu um and but they were just they were never here and there's no coincidence that the, the countries that did very well, that did better in uh, combating the virus had experienced this. Um, I think there was maybe a little bit of an exceptionalism there, um, especially on part of uh, our government, um, well, our governments. Um, I think you know, I think in many ways you were exceptional, but in all the worst ways. You only have to look at the, the figures for, for, for deaths and cases to, and especially in care homes to realise that, yeah, we, um, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do too well. And then... On, on that, continuing that theme, was there a moment also when um, you suddenly did realise, damn, th th this is big, this is this is not what we expected, it does happen here, and it does happen, it is happening now. Is there a moment when you look back and think, yeah, that's when it really hit home? It's, it's hard to think about how I was feeling at the time, because I've gone over it all so many times to write the book. So um, it feels like I've gone through so many articles and um, like, uh, news clips. It's just been, um, it's been a bit strong, but I guess, I think everyone watched the press conference when um, you had, um, uh, I mean, the typical one to start with was Johnson, um, uh, Valence and Chris Whitty and the line, some people you love will probably die. And I think everyone can kind of remember those press conferences. And it was, it's surreal because I think with, with media how it is now, most people don't all watch the same thing at the same time with the exception of sport. But actually I remember us in the newsroom all gathered around talking and just been like, just watching this thing that we knew was quite extraordinary. But uh, I, yeah, I think it was those press conferences that really hit home for, for me and other people might have. I mean, if you lost someone early on from the virus, that would absolutely have been when it would be. But uh, for me, I think that was when it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all remember that one. And I think um, for you, obviously, you react to that in two ways. You react to that professionally as a journalist, but then you also react to it on a personal level, because it was, I think it's fair to say, a genuinely 
frightening moment and a frightening time, wasn't it? How how do you balance those things out professionally? Um, I think it's I think it's weird for journalists because it's the it's the whole thing, isn't it, that someone has to have their worst day for us to have our best day. Um, so when quite horrible things happen, it, it sounds terrible. But some of your actually is right. Oh, okay, right. I need to. What do we need to do? How do we need to cover this? How do we need to make this relevant to readers? And um, I I don't know. I just uh, just trying to kind of um, a picture. I think I think the the how bad it was only um, crept up on you. I think quite a lot of people maybe didn't actually feel how tough things have been until maybe two or three months into it. If you especially if you're working on your own or you know you like the, I, I know myself and a few other colleagues and we were working from home to start with. We're like, oh, this is great. You know, I've I haven't put on trousers. <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> and then um, after you just you miss those small interactions. And like I said, I, we weren't covered in PPE or having to work long night shifts under great pressure. But um, still, it was tough. And I think uh, I think everyone did find it. And Annie's still finding it tough even now. Can I just check? Are you wearing trousers now? Um, <laughs> if everyone buys the book, I will show everyone as a treat. <laughs> OK, um, so, yes, it was undoubtedly a baptism of fire for you. Life was not as you anticipated it would be in those either in those early days or as the weeks and months rolled on. Out of that, however, you managed to find a theme for a book. Tell us about that process and how the idea came about and more importantly, perhaps why the idea came about. Some people might ask. Well. I think the, the theme of the book is that this was this wasn't something that was unpredictable. COVID-19 didn't take a healthy, functioning, fair society and make it sick. It, it actually I think to use COVID-19 language, we had a lot of underlying health conditions in our society. Um, if the way the analogy I use in the book is um, if you imagine a, a road, a tarmac road um, and uh, there's little cracks in the road. Now those cracks, you can you could list them off the top of your head. Um, so inequality for people of colour, um, women, domestic violence, lack of crit critical care capacity in hospitals, um, general underfunding of our hospitals, short termism, um, a chaotic and confused care system, um, uh, overcrowded prisons, uh, a lack of respect for science and thought, basically. <laughs> Um, uh, air pollution, poor housing, all of these things are small cracks in the road. And coronavirus was kind of like the water that got into those cracks and then froze overnight and then broke them open. So I think um, that was the theme for me, that actually it, it essentially punished us as a society for everything we didn't fix while the sun was shining. And um, that was what kind of, uh, that's what came out for me. And I think the reason it was important to write a book and it's important that other people cover this in a broader way is for to us to understand what has happened to us. This isn't a book for, as Mick says, politicians or self-styled styled politicos. It's about, it's for people in Wales to understand what has just happened to them. Because I think it's important for us to understand what has happened here because firstly, to not let politicians off the hook for what are serious failings. Um, I think if you allow that to happen, you make it inevitable that this will happen again, because it's inevitable there's going to be another virus or another disease. It, it's going to happen. It might not be in the next five years, but it will happen. The only thing we have under our control is our ability to, is how we handle it. And if we don't understand what's happened and we don't learn lessons and we're not aware of this, I think it will mean that it can easily happen again. And I, I think the final reason it, it's important that we, we understand. It's also for a bit of collective healing. It's been quite, as I say, traumatic for a lot of people and understanding I think is the first stage of moving forward. But I mean, a, an example is, if you're a child who turns four next March, you will have lived 25% of your life under COVID, some kind of COVID restrictions in all likelihood. And to have the formative years of your life being told, don't go near your friend, Make sure you play within your circle in the playground. That's a really, that's really damaging. And I think we shouldn't let people off the hook for that happening. And we should also 
we should also help ourselves understand so that we can start to move forward as a society and like heal those quite traumatic things that have happened. If that wasn't the most long-winded answer to a very simple question you've ever had. Not at all, not at all. So two important themes emerge from, from that answer then there. Let, let's unpack those. So first of all, um, the fractures to society that were in place and, and to, to quote that that lovely analogy that you've used that the water got in froze and made those fractures worse I think there's a lot of truths there it's however it's not a finger pointing book is it would, would you agree um it, it's not finger pointing in regards as it's not necessarily angry um I think I don't think you need to with topics like this I don't think you need to say this look at how bad this person is. I think a lot of it's self-evident. I think readers are very capable of drawing their own conclusions over whether not testing people as they went into a care home is a mistake or something bad. I, I think people are quite capable of drawing those conclusions themselves. Um, there's no doubt that there are, there have been mistakes and that isn't just in Westminster, uh, it's also in Cardiff Bay. Um, there's a lot of things that you can point to and say, this could have been done better. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it's political in that way, but it, it does identify where there are issues because it would be disingenuous not to um, to do that. You, you've been on, on the odd occasion, you, you've used your, and quite rightly you've used your position to be a little critical sometimes. Does that continue in the book or do you not see that as your role in this context here? Um, I mean, it, it's, it's tricky because ultimately it's not about, me saying oh, I think this is bad so so should you it's about saying well these are all the things that have happened I mean there are occasions where things are completely open to debate I mean a, a huge debate in the summer in Wales was had we did we stay locked down for too long the impact that has on jobs and the economy and or um, on the flip side you know if you open up too quickly it, it could risk lives and that's a completely legitimate debate and you can have that on either side I, I and you can't say that either side is necessarily wrong. Their judgment calls and politicians have got, uh, I mean, who, who would do that? What, a, what an enviable job. But there are things that you can point to and say were wrong. I, I think, um, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, I, there's one chat, part of a chapter which said what Dominic Cummings said he did and why it's bollocks. And that was quite a nice thing to write because it was... You could lay out reasons why what he did was, by almost any definition, not um, not correct. And I don't think it's political to point out something that's quite clear. And I think it's it's dangerous in journalism to not be able, not point out things which are self evident and clear. I mean, you, you, we saw it if we want to talk about vaccines with MMR. You there's not and the debate whether it causes autism. Um, there was one person who was completely discredited who said it did, and everyone else said it didn't. There's nothing wrong with saying unequivocally, no, it doesn't, this is all the evidence. That isn't, to, to give two sides of an equal debate isn't balance, and that's what I've tried to do um, in the book. Okay, thank you. Now, to, to cut back to the, the second point you made about the fractured society, but it's also about people, isn't it? You make the point that this isn't about making political points in this book, it's about the people of Wales. And from the excerpts I've seen, you have been, um, you've used some of those human stories, haven't you, to, to demonstrate um, that. So yes, we all know the numbers, we know the appalling headline figures, and we know what we've, what we've seen on the news, but uh, you have got back to tell some of those stories of, of what have been unbelievably heartbreaking stories. And you know, many of our lives have been touched by those. Talk to us about that process and why you felt it really important to incorporate those human stories into the book. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's weird. When, um, like at the start of the crisis, um, like Wales Online, um, Western Mail, South Wales Echo, all covered, um, especially early on, examples of people who had died from the virus. And when there's only been five deaths in Wales, if you tell the story of one of those people who've died, their family, their job, it really brings it to life. And as the numbers grew and grew and grew, and the cases grew and grew and grew, um, it's really easy to lose the fact that these are all people. And um, I think uh, if you see 1,000 people have died in Wales of coronavirus, or you see die from Caerphilly, father of three, um, 
who was a welder and loved Cardiff City. Um, you, that automatically you you can you're drawn to that so much more, even though obviously a thousand people dying is much more significant. But obviously people respond to people; they don't respond to stats or numbers. And I think um, an example I use in the book is if you think of the migrant crisis. Like I know, I think I'm going to forget the number off the top of my head now, but hundreds of thousands of people have died crossing um, the Mediterranean. Um, but none of that, and I know as a compassionate person that that is a, a terrible thing, but none of that raises the same um, emotion in me as when we, you see the young boy dead on a beach in Bodrum. Um, and I think that's what I wanted to kind of do in the book is so every couple of chapters, it just brings up somebody who has lost their life and it tells just us a little bit about them. Um, and it, it's just to kind of bring it back to the people, not the numbers, um, which is, um, yeah, what I've tried to try to do with it. So um, it, it's it's a tough thing to do. And um, but I think it's I think it's really important else. It just becomes a story about stats. And actually, it's a story about people because that's really what it's all about. And that's what people actually care about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Were there any that particularly stood out for you or really struck home for you? Um, I wouldn't say any more than the other. Um, you, the, the thing that strikes home is the, the range. Um, what did strike home was the amount of them, uh, people who died and were out in the media who were um, uh, people of colour in the medical profession. Um, I, I, that was obviously a, a huge story. and There's a whole chapter dedicated to it in the book. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it was, I don't think any of them can jump out particularly um, just because they're... Um, they're all pretty, pretty individual. I mean, you, there's loads of journalists on this call now, so they'll all know you do become a little bit, um, numb is probably the wrong word, but you, you do distance yourself from stuff a little bit. And then it's when you kind of read back through and I was reading back through, it took me a bit by surprise reading it. And I was like, oh God, yeah, that's, that's awful. <laughs> I promise you, it's not just the most miserable book in the world though. I, I know this is probably the most depressing, like uh, 26 minutes you've had of your lives at the moment, but uh, I promise you it's, it's not just endless misery. No, it's, it's not from what I certainly isn't. That brings us nicely on to cast the net a bit wider in terms of the themes. What do you think then um, we have learnt about Wales and what Wales has learnt about itself from this last year? Um, I think there's definitely been a bit of an awakening, uh, awakening of Wales' um, devolved consciousness, really. Um, a really good example is people now know who Mark Drakeford is. Um, if you'd shown a picture of Mark Drakeford to many people, they wouldn't have, uh, they, they wouldn't have known. He'd have just been a weird guy in an allotment talking about cheese. Um, and yet um, now people know who the first minister is. Now, it doesn't mean that they see, they like what they see or they think this is fantastic, this is great, but they at least know, probably they're more informed on who runs their health service. And um, that's been a combination of necessity because people might go across to England and realise the rules are different. Why is that? Or it might be that um, they, you know, they read one of the hundred thousand articles we did saying why rules are different. Um, but I, I think nobody can look at the current setup in the UK and think, well, this is working really well. It might be that you interpret what's happened as we devolution is a a waste of time, we need to um, have just one single nation approach, or it might be you go completely the other way and say, oh, we need an independent Wales. It, the stats suggest that most people are some, uh, the uh, poll suggests most people are in the middle of that. Um, but I don't think you can look at a system where the you've got essentially a federal state with um, Scotland, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland, and the leader of one of the states England also happens to be the head of the whole thing. It would be very much like um, the governor of California also been the president of the United States. It just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think there's definitely been an awakening of devolved consciousness, how people interpret that in <laughs> a kind of post-Brexit world. There could be some wild solutions to this. Um, my inclination is a huge wholesale changes either way is, is a little bit like burning down your house because you've got a leak in your roof. <laughs> what you want is good governance, however it is. Um, but um, I mean, I, I, I don't even want to touch that on a debate that might be going on YouTube. What, what about what, um, 
what we've learned about how people outside of Wales view Wales, would you say uh, there have been some frustrations there, I think, this year? Would that be fair to say? Um, I, I think um, I think it's blown people's mind in some places that Wales has got a different government, maybe. Um, I think, uh, I mean, there's a whole bit on the communication from the UK government, but uh, on the start of May, you'll remember when Wales opted not to really make any large changes, but um, in, uh, Boris Johnson announced to the British public, drive as far as you want to a beach. And you had Welsh um, police um, police leaders saying, no, no, really don't do that. You, you're not allowed to come here. That's, <laughs> that's not actually allowed. Um, when you've got, and I can understand why people in Wales were confused by that. If I, for example, live in Merford Tidville, I voted, um, Conservative, I um, watch the news and I switch off before it goes to the regional news. If the person who I voted for as Prime Minister is standing there as Prime Minister and saying, you can do this, I completely understand why someone would assume, yeah, of course I can do that. You wouldn't. So um, I think there has been, um, I think there has been a lot of confusion. I think there could have been a lot less confusion. Um, and um, I mean, and so some people just don't care, do they? I mean, the amount of, I think we made great, um, we made, a, we did a lot of stories of people who'd driven from random place in another part of the UK to buy a camper van in Tenby um, and stuff like that. I think uh, I saw those stories a lot, especially during the uh, kind of first three months of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. that, that brings us nicely then to um, how, Wales is viewed from England. I think, yes, quite a lot of mistakes were made over the border in, in how we are viewed and, and quite shockingly sometimes in, in how um, the media on the, other, on the other side of the border views Wales. What about, what, what would your end of year report be for the media here in, in Wales? Now, obviously you're part of the media, um, but collectively, how has it been handled and what sort of game have we played here this year? Um, well, Obviously, I can't speak for the media and I can barely, but I can't really speak for Wales Online either. Um, but what, what I would say is um, more people than ever, like millions and millions of people came to um, Wales Online during um, the pandemic. Well, during the ongoing pandemic, um, our even though shops were closing and people were told to stay home, our newspaper sales held up remarkably well. Um, when people, I, I think it's really important that when people are worried, when they're scared for their jobs and lives and way of life, um, they're going to go to people that they trust. And the fact is, people did come to the media in huge numbers. Yes, there's a lot of fake news swirling around online, but people were coming to consume the media from us. And I think one thing I think we did really well, um, it's not just holding politicians to account and people think that holding politicians to account is just shouting at them and pointing at them and saying x y and z but actually if you, there's plenty of that going on on twitter you can you can have a go at a politician in more ways than you can ever have imagined 15 years ago and do we really think our politicians have got better and more accountable because of that i i don't think they do i think the the best thing one of the best things we did was just inform saying this is the new this is um the symptom early early on these are the symptoms of the virus this is what you should do if you self isolate this is where you can go to get fun, um support this is this is the situation right now in welsh care homes um and i think offering that to people and having people understand in real time what is happening in their lives we did really really well we could have obviously done it better and, and we have daily conversations about how we can cover things um, better i mean I'm, I'm not taking any of the credit for this. There was one um, press conference where um, I did the questions and I was like, right, I'm going to absolutely nail this politician now. I'm going to be great. I'm going to be the darling of Twitter. Everyone's going to think I'm fantastic. And um, Dave James, our head of news, said, um, why don't you just ask them about what's going to happen with schools? And I was like, what? what? Oh, oh. And actually, that was entirely the right decision to do. It's not just about having a go at someone to be seen to have a go at them it's about the people who are reading your journalism leaving more informed when when they arrived and he dave did a, a really good quote which um i've 
actually wildly plagiarized myself um, since, um, is that um, people were really, really interested in the virus that's killing them and actually just informing people so that they can make informed decisions is something I think journalists did really, really well over the course of this. Obviously there's, there's, you can eat, you could find a store, an article on any news website and say that could have been done better, but there's a reason why after the Dominic Cummings, um, what should we call it? Saga, high speed, eye test, high velocity eye test. Um, there's a reason why they limited um, journalists to just one question and it's because they were doing a good job and they were asking hard questions so and there's a reason they'd stopped doing daily press conferences when the Welsh government have continued doing it it's because maybe it's because people in Wales are asking too many easy questions of the Welsh government that's why they haven't got rid of it but um uh, they, I think journalists have acquitted themselves well as a rule um under under tough conditions but you you could always do better I think Okay. So on the subject of those those um, now infamous Downing Street press conferences, we've seen you on a couple of those, haven't we? What goes on? Come on, tell us the secrets. What are they like? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so boring. Um, they um, you you go on and it's a Zoom call like this, and um, it was quite surreal before the um, before the uh, UK one of the UK government ones. Um, I'd got a call from um, the Downing Street press office and they'd said, um, oh, just because you're because um, you're obviously it's devolved and they, they might not be fully across what you're asking. Can you just give us a, an outline of what you're what you're going to ask? And uh, oh, there are times when you do want to tell the person you're interviewing something about what you're going to ask them. For instance, if you were asking the first minister how many care homes currently have um, COVID cases, there's, it's in your interest to tell them you're going to be asking that because if not they're just gonna go well I don't have that to hand and then you and your readers are no more informed but the vast majority of time you don't want to be revealing what you're going to be asking so I just said well I'm going to talk about communication um, between um, uh, about Welsh and English issues and I was actually asked them about why they use such vague misleading language um, but I think they interpreted it as um, uh, is there any communication between the Welsh and um, UK government? And um, Dominic Raab just answered a, a totally different question, but I don't think I can really put that down to any of my <laughs> or been misleading. I think um, judging by some of his other answers, I probably got one of the better ones. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Let's now, now at this absolute moment in time, whatever date it is, December the 7th, tomorrow is yet another big day yeah. in this story, isn't it? The vaccines are starting to be administered to certain people. This story, it's far from over, isn't it? We're at we're at a midpoint. We keep hearing the phrase, is this beginning of the end of the story? We just don't know yet. But how did you know where to leave the story in your book? Where did you leave the story and how did you make that work? Um, that's um, that's a good question. Um, I, I didn't know to start with. Um, me and Mick had a lot of conversations in May saying, Oh, when is this going to be over? You know, um, when do we wrap this up? And obviously, we could you could probably legitimately and ask um, you could legitimately write a book in ten years' time talking about the ongoing impact of coronavirus, such as especially the economic impact going to be and possibly the cultural impact. Um, we decided that the best point to end the chronological part of the book was um, the first day where there was no recorded deaths announced in Wales, which was the 6th of July, um, which was devastating because I didn't get to cover, well, it wasn't devastating that no one died. Um, it was devastating because um, I didn't get to cover the um, whole debacle around um, uh, exam results and things like that. So that was obviously um, frustrating, but you, you have to do an endpoint else you have to divide, put these lines in history else history is just big bang to present you have to put these kind of arbitrary distinctions so yeah we decided to end it and just kind of do it as the story of the first wave um because i think decision i really believe decisions made in april i think decisions to allow a stereophonics gig to go ahead back in march had a real impact on the um outbreak that we're seeing now i think you handle something better you cut those lines of transmission earlier we've seen in other countries that it is possible to keep on top of um the limit the damage done by this virus.
okay. It's the, it is the eternal frustration, isn't it, for a, for a journalist? Whenever your deadline is, you're always going to miss the next story and the next story the ne and the next story when, when you work in print. So, yes, absolutely identify there. What, um, do you fancy in writing another one? A second, uh, a, well, a, a follow-up story? Sandra, I don't want to overlook a computer ever again. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be lovely. And um, I can't actually see Mick on my screen, but I'm going to try and make eye contact with him. Um, uh, it'd be lovely to write a, a, something else in the future. Um, I don't think I'd ever want to write something with this much of a time deadline while working full time as well. I think that was um, that was quite a hard thing to do, um, especially because I was on this kind of spot. I would be I would get up. I'd write a bit of the book about coronavirus, I'd then work writing about coronavirus and then I'd finish work and write about coronavirus. So I don't think I'd want to do that again. But um, it, um, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and complain. Oh, it was really hard writing my book. It was, it was, it's an amazing opportunity and it was really fun. So yes, it'd be, it'd be cool to do something in the future, but uh, probably not um, uh, like 90 odd thousand words in two and a half months. <laughs> no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, Clearly none of us have a crystal ball, possibly quite thankfully. If you did, where do you think this story is going next? What possibly happened next? Do we have more twists and turns along the way? Is this the beginning of the end? What does Will Hayward predict is going to happen next? Will Hayward doesn't have a clue and would never <laughs> suggest he has a clue. Um, what I would say is um, the 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 best thing that can possibly come from from this is we learn a lesson um, about um, preparing for things we know are coming. Like we knew there'd be a virus at some point. Um, we also know about climate change, for instance. If um, the parallels between the climate emergency and COVID are huge, I mean, experts in both cases saying there is going to be a real problem. You need to do this and people not doing that thing. Um, also the fact that the people who are gonna be hit hardest are gonna be the poorest and the people least able to deal with it. Um, the difference between COVID and the climate emergency is by the time we're seeing people, people's lives be ruined in Wales by the climate emergency, you, it's far too late to have actually done anything about it. Um, it it's, I, I mean, it's, the, the best time to have done something about it would have been 10 years ago when they were literally saying exactly the same thing. But if if now this is seen as a, a dry run for this and people do learn their lessons from and we can learn our lessons from this and realise that you've got to fix the um, uh, uh, roof while the sun's shining. That's a great analogy for climate change as well, isn't it? Um, then I think it'd be um, it'd be a really uh, that would be something the good that could come out of it. So I, I couldn't I'm not going to predict anything that could happen. I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, or anything like that but I, I would suggest that if we don't learn that lesson it will be um, to all our detriment. A fair point. Now I'm going to take some questions um, in a moment. The last thing I wanted to put to you, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to roll the clock back yet again. This time we're going back to Will Hayward as a seven-year-old. Now at that time you'd fair to say that you'd, you'd struggled a bit and it was around about that time in your life that you were diagnosed with dyslexia. The start of a, um, a well, in the middle of a struggle for you. I'm assuming then that seven-year-old boy never dreamt that he was going to be a published author. Uh, no, I think that seven-year-old boy thought he was going to be a paleontologist um, and with actual dinosaurs. Um, uh, it's it's the dyslexia as well. I mean, I've got um, there's a friend on this call uh, called Damien who sat next to me in English, and he must have copying his spelling must have got me through um, <laughs> uh, that class. Um, but yeah, it, it's um, it it's uh, it, it's weird. I, I mean, I don't think I ever assumed when I was young know, I'd write for a living because I'd actively avoid writing stuff. Um, it's uh, I mean, like even now, like. I mean, poor Mick, who had to go through the copy I gave in the the, the misspelt words. I mean, the I mean, I'm really lucky, but I had parents who were both really supportive and could, you know, help pay for stuff to help me. I mean, I must have I must have had all sorts of things. I had triangle shaped pens. I had um, I had bifocals at one point, um, which after one day in school were quickly um, lost. 
Um, I um, yeah, so it is a, it is quite surreal to be writing um, for a living, but I think it is <laughs> having something like dyslexia. I mean, I, in no way did I have it really severely. There's people who struggle much much more than than I do. Um, but I think it, it probably does make you um, find other ways of doing things. It probably makes you resourceful in other ways. So, um, and I think I was probably under a bit of a um, bit of an illusion that journalism is all about writing. Like all the best, like loads of the best journalists I know, many of which are on this call. And I can literally see their faces right now. I'm going to let them work out which ones I'm pointing at. Um, um, our the reason they're really good journalists is because they are really tenacious and they're really insightful and they're really good at making, writing things in a way that people can understand. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, long story short, no, I don't think I'd ever have thought I would have uh, been uh, writing a book, but um, here we are. Well, hats off to you for that achievement. That's, uh, it's quite something, quite something to be proud of. Now then, I can see we've got plenty of questions coming in from the floor. Let's have a look at some of those, if we may. Uh, let's start off with, I've got one from um, Sue Thurlow. Hello to Sue, who says, uh, Sue says, I'm from a Welsh background. Without stereotyping, do you think there are particular characteristics that helped Welsh communities or individuals to cope with the restrictions during lockdown? Over to you, Will. Um well, I, I mean, there's there's traits within Wales, which means it was much harder to deal with the lockdown. Wales is um, poorer. Uh, it's um, it's on average sicker. There's higher rates of in, um, higher rates of um, um, things like asthma. Um, it's also got a far higher amount of manufacturing than um, other parts of the UK. So um, if um, people have been furloughed and you're not able to go into work, you can't really work from home if you work in a factory. Production lines don't go through living rooms. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why it would have been really hard. It would have been harder for Wales. Um, I think anyone who lives in Wales is from Wales, uh, knows how close some of the Welsh community, some communities in Wales are. Um, there, there's a reason why I came here and never left. Um, people are lovely. It's um, it's such it's a wonderful place to to live. Um, I think supporting each other is um a trait you've seen i'm not saying this is a uniquely welsh trait but um uh, I, I think maybe in some parts of the country it's almost made it harder because we have people who are more likely to go into each other's houses um i remember i did a, a um an article on my steg and in my steg you just knock and walk in um, uh, is what uh, and obviously if you live very close to people the virus does does spread more but i think um, I think Wales is a wonderful place to work, report and live. And um, having that sort of people around you can only make it easier, ultimately, I think, to deal with a, a pandemic like this. I'd echo that, certainly. Uh, next question, I can see we have one from Laura Coyne. Good evening to you, Laura. She asks, what do you think about the Welsh Government's communication to the public during the pandemic? Um, do do sorry. Do you think they were successful in cultivating a sense of social responsibility among the popul population, or did they perhaps inadvertently hinder it? Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's that's quite a question. They um they did uh, they did some things well. I think there is a reason why Mark Drakeford's popularity went up because I think he was quite a juxtaposition. Um, to people like Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock. Um, if you've seen Mark Drakeford speak, you can tell that he was a professor in university. Um, he likes to explain and explain and explain, um, which, is a, which is a really good thing. And explaining to people is good. I think there's been times when, um, I, I think there's been time when some of the jargon probably has been um, more management speak, a bit more David Brent, not necessarily just like from Drakeford, but from other, people in the cabinet um, when we're talking about stakeholders and strategic partners when what we mean to say is doctors and nurses. Um, I think you, you lose people when you talk like that. Um, I think we, we were, there, a lot has been put on social, on um, like community responsibility on, on us taking account of our own actions, um, especially in the second wave. And frankly, it's because they don't know how to slow the virus without going into strict lockdowns. Um, 
it's I mean it's a thankless task to do it. I think they've scored some own goals. Um, I, I think the um, non-essential item ban in supermarkets, while well-meaning, was always going to be a distraction for very for little or no gain. Um, I think they, especially early on, they followed the science um, and that was the rationale for everything. And that was the rationale for not testing people going into care homes. Um, you know, that that that's ridiculous. Not only were they three weeks later than other parts of the UK in doing that test, or, or at least two weeks later, sorry. Um, science, especially in something that's developing, isn't, it's, it's not a case of, um, oh, the science says this, we do this. You've been elected, you've stood for office on the provider, you are best placed to make decisions that affect people's lives. And to simply say, I'm following the science really just doesn't cut it. The buck stops with you. And it's your job to interpret that, to take all that information and then make a collective decision. And I think there are times that they could have done that better. Um, but um, yeah, who, who'd be a politician? <laughs> yes, yes, quite right now. Um, I have a question also from uh, Simon Collins. Good evening to Simon. He's asking, do you talk in the book about um, the misinformation and Facebook's role during the pandemic? So the role of, of social media and Facebook in general. There's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, the, the problem with misinformation, um, and especially it coming from government, is that once you've... Misinformation can be incredibly useful for a government. Um, if um, it, you, we saw in the US when the Republican Party wouldn't condemn the um, Obama, people questioning Obama's place of birth. Everyone knew that he was a US citizen. He was born in Hawaii, but it was politically expedient to allow that misinformation to go around. And we saw it in our election last year. The um, Conservative Party changed their press office, Twitter, to um, uh, what was it? Fact Check UK. Um, even though it was the Conservative Press Office, we saw um, the same campaign for the LabourManifesto.com website and then put anti-Labour stuff there. And th this isn't just a uniquely um, Conservative uh, thing either, by the way. But um, the problem is, once that genie is out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. And now they're at a stage where they're like, oh, sugar, people think 5G causes coronavirus. People think vaccines are going to kill them and put a microchip sponsored by Bill Gates in their neck. What are they talking about? People, as soon as you start allowing this sort of stuff to happen, I mean, in the book, we talk about one point, somebody damaged the 5G masks, which supplied one of the Nightingale hospitals in Birmingham. Like, you can't, and then our government are like, oh, well, our government's like, well, we need to, we need to do something about this information, this misinformation, but you can't be the cure if you're also part of the disease. And you, I mean, it's something we do explore in the book again and again and again. Um, for instance, limiting journalists' questions at the press conferences because they asked hard questions. Um, you know, if if you do that, if you subscribe to Democracy Dies in the Dark, that's them turning on the dimmer switch. So I think it's um, it's definitely something we explore in the book. But you don't need to buy it now. I've told you all. <laughs> We've got time for a couple more, I'm hoping. Let's see how many we can get through. Um, there is a question from Richard Houdmont, or Houdmont, apologies, I'm not sure how to pronounce. Um, but Richard asks, uh, COVID doesn't recognize borders, and yet the media coverage seems to be obsessed with borders and the anomalies. Do you think, therefore, there will be long-term consequences of that? Um, I, I think... I mean, that's that's tricky because it, it is complete. It would be disingenuous not to talk about um, differences between what Wales are doing and what England are doing. Um, we're although Wales and England are different nations, they're all part of the UK. Um, the government of the UK also governs in Wales um, uh, on several different areas. So discussing if there's a better way of doing things is not uh, I don't think isn't a. Uh, is, is quite a necessary thing to do. I think also there's a difference between England and Wales as opposed to England and Scotland. We've got a much longer border. Um, it's much more heavily populated. It's much more porous. There's suggestions that, especially the outbreaks in Wrexham, Denbyshire, Flintshire, a lot of that was linked to Liverpool. And that isn't just, ah, oh, from 
uh, track and trace. That's from analysing the sewage in that area and they're finding strains. Um, yeah, no, shit went down. I can see someone nodding. Um, the, um, uh, they're finding strains in the sewers in Gwenevan Conway, which um, are strains which originated on Merseyside. Um, so these are these are facts. These are things that are happening, and you do have to look at it. But I think, I think the the reason, as you say, maybe the media were obsessed with it isn't necessarily the word I'd used use. But I think part of that is because we have such a messy constitutional system. There's not clearly defined lines. There's not clearly defined silos where this is a Welsh thing, this is an English thing. We are tied together, and I think you you can't just write about that and we we don't just write about welsh news for instance we write about news that's relevant to our readers we covered stuff to do with donald trump because we felt like that was of relevance and interest to our readers so it is definitely something that we would we would cover but i think long-term consequences is goes back to the people being aware of the um devolved consciousness i think the next thing that affects lots of different parts of the uk people will be more savvy i hope um with regard to what's happening on the subject of people being savvy, Anne Starr is asking the question. She's asking what you're seeing at the moment. And Anne, good evening to you. Anne asks, are the people in the area where you live, Will, following the Welsh government guidelines? So what are you seeing around you right now? Um, well, I live in Adamsdown. So actually, <laughs> over the course of this, I actually saw a drug deal <laughs> outside my house. There's a, um, there's a car over the road, um, which actually has um, uh, some interesting guys in, which have just um, swapped a few things out of the window a couple of times. But um, I think in my area generally, um, in it, I mean, I think people have, I think the vast majority of people have stuck to rules. And I think people want to stick to the rules. Um, I think... <sighs> I think the problem is it doesn't take much for it to spread. It's a very easily spread virus. Um, uh, I mean, people are, people are people are break the rules. You see it all the time. You see people not socially distancing. You see people across the uh, across the road, um, uh, like having a house party, for instance. Um, but I think most people are trying to keep within the rules as best they can. Um, I think one of the problems is a lot of people do get quite confused about what the rules are. I think because we write about it every single day. Um, it's quite easy to um, assume that everyone knows, but most people have lives outside of news and like fair play to them, wish I did. Um, so um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think most people have followed it, but a significant minority haven't. And I think that's a part of the problem. And they are obviously in way to blame because you have to take personal responsibility, but I think there's a lot of other issues around messaging um, that also have not made it as easy as it could have been to follow the rules, if that wasn't too long. Sorry to take you into a, um, an insight into the lovely area of which I live in Cardiff. <laughs> not, not at all. I'm assuming that the drug dealers were doing it from a social distance, mind you. Oh, oh, oh absolutely, absolutely. They're all wearing masks. <laughs> On that, just, just to wrap up, I know we're, we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour now. Um, on the subject of what we're seeing around us now, the vaccine is nearly here. It's so close now, like Christmas. Do you think there's almost going to be uh, an effect or people know that that's around the corner? Oh, look, the cure's nearly here. Therefore, we're going to do what we like. Is there a little bit of that mentality going on right now? Um, I don't know. I think um, I think most people are still. I mean, if we do a piece around rules or around risks it's some of our most read journalism um people are people want to follow the rules people want to understand um i think part of the reason why they um the governments across the uk have opted for um a bit of a um lowering of restrictions over christmas is because they know that people will just break it anyway and the problem is as soon as you break it a bit it's easy to just keep doing it so i think it's but they've had the thought of it's better just to keep people, you know, on on side and um, within the rules to then uh, bring it down a bit for Christmas. I mean, uh, someone from the Welsh government said to me last week, we're in touching distance of um, a real sense of normality. Um, but it, even if you vaccinate everyone in Wales now, it's going to be, which you can't do for the numbers, for logistical reasons, for a whole range of things. In three weeks time, we still wouldn't be protected and 
it only takes a few days of the NHS to be overwhelmed, meaning people die who didn't need to die. Um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, I, I hope there's not a, uh, a big um, uh, upswing in non-compliance. Um, but because, uh, I mean, <laughs> anyone here as a journalist knows that we cover every year how the NHS is overwhelmed and that's before COVID. So uh, um, I hope there isn't. OK, one final thing for me before I hand back. When all this is over, will we be a better society, do you think? Um, I think we'll be a different society. Um, um, I think, I, I, I hope so. Um, I think, uh, I mean, that's a much bigger question than I feel like I could possibly answer. But um, I think, uh, I think it will just be different. I mean, we're, I think working from home is gonna be quite a big change for a lot of people and in some ways could be fantastic. Um, it, as long as people, the evidence all suggests that if you choose to work from home, it's a very nice people, it's a better way of life for people. But if it's imposed on them, they tend not to find it as easy. Um, uh, like I say, going back to the thing before, if um, if we learn lessons about climate change, it'll be uh, it'll be kind of, uh, it'll be, I don't want to say worth it because crikey, thousands, tens of thousands of people are dead, but um, it, it will be um, not quite as um, devastating. <laughs> Well, let's hope there's some things we can take from it. Well, I think as we wrap up, there are some thank yous that you would like to offer up. I'm going to hand over to you to do that now. Yeah. Um, sorry if uh, that was uh, immensely depressing, guys. It was. I promise you, I promise you the book isn't actually as miserable as it's just come across. Um, so there's a few thank yous I want to go through. There's actually loads of people who I um, would like to thank, but... I'd just be here all day just listing names who none of you know. So I am um, just want to go for a few. Um, first, I do feel like I'm capitalising on everyone's collective misery by doing a, a book on coronavirus. Um, uh, but um, firstly, I just want to thank, obviously, key workers, especially people in hospitals with full PPE who are doing this all day, every day. Um, like, so thank you for that. It's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, they've got a real job. Like, we write stories for a living. It's, it's quite nice. Um, uh, also, the people whose stories I told um, of the families of people who died during the um, the uh, outbreak, who I um, who I mentioned in it. Obviously, I need to need to thank them. Um, there's um, I want to thank everyone at Seren, um, especially Mick and Sarah, um, for taking a chance on a new writer. I think when Mick got handed all of those words badly spelt, he probably um, regretted it immediately um, and lost uh, day, uh, days of his life. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I really felt with Mick that he wasn't trying to get me to write a book he wanted written. He just wanted to make my book better. And um, speaking to other people who've written books, that's, um, that's quite a rare thing. So thank you so much um, for that. Um, I just really want to thank all my colleagues at Wales Online, the Western Mail and the Echo. Um, I've been there four and a half years and um, I think when I first went, I was really nervous. You go into a place, um, a newsroom, it can feel like quite an intimidating environment, but everyone there is just so lovely and they're so supportive. And I count so many of them as my, um, as my friends. It, it's great, but they're not just nice and lovely. They're all immensely talented. Um, I've, I've been given so many opportunities there to like, follow football teams around for a month and take air quality samples outside of schools in Newport for a pollution story. And I only get given the time to do that because loads of people are working their ass off getting um, stories that um, people in Wales want to read. And people in Wales read us in enormous numbers. Most people in Wales read Wales online, um, which is um, which is fantastic. It's a testament to everyone I work with. Um, uh, and they don't get... Um, outside of the organization they don't get credit in fact quite often they'll get quite a lot of um, hate from people often people who will keep coming back four or five times a day to read their journalism and be insulted by them so um uh, yeah thanks to all my um, my colleagues um uh four people i just want to thank in particular um uh, paul roland for giving me the chance in this role and um, that was uh, very uh, kind of him um uh, Trist Williams, who's the Echo editor, who gave me a chance to write my first column there after I'd been there nine months. That was something um, I really appreciated. And um, he, when he saw some of the trash I wrote about, I can't, I imagine he uh, had a bit of a feeling like Mick did. Um, 
Catherine from uh, the Western Mail editor um, who's on this call. So thank you, Catherine, for um, all the support um, with um, covering the book and um, offering to uh, serialize it in um, the new year. So that's, I'm very grateful. And uh, also Dave James, who um, has saved me from myself many, many times this year. And um, he, <laughs> um, he makes my journalism much better than it is. And um, he's also, He's, he's one of the cleverest guys I know, and he's also relentlessly backdropped by his children, by his many, many children, when I speak to him on the phone. Um, I, uh, there's been days, uh, there's been weeks that have gone by where Dave's been the only person from work I've spoken to on the phone, so uh, it feels like we've um, both been in kind of this together. Um, but, I mean, it, I could thank everyone there. It's a, it's a great place to work. Um, uh, friends, um, I've, I'm really lucky with the friends that I've got and who've helped me through it. So, um, a there's so many on this call some who've helped specifically with the book um is my friend rob um, we went for some great jogs while he uh, heard me out um at social distance um rachel Kay for all her um, advice um and james mcleod who is like my brother and uh, he's the best friend uh, uh, you could ask for and he basically kept me fed um with some great food parcels over this time um I've also got, in fact, I'm going to move it so she's on my screen. There she is. Uh, I'd also like to thank my beautiful girlfriend, Rachel, um, who has the patience of a saint. Um, her love and support during this have been immense and there simply wouldn't have been a book um, without her. So I can't really put into words how grateful I am for um, everything you did. So thank you. <laughs> I love you. Um, uh, my family, um, my brother Dan, for some great distractions. Um, my dad, who is so passionately interested in everything that I do. I can't imagine how a man who lives in Coventry could possibly give a shit about anything I'm talking about in Wales. And yet he somehow seems to be interested. He's either the best actor in the world or he actually genuinely is interested. So um, fair, play, fair play to him. Um, the, the only problem with it is he gives me such a high opinion of myself that I write, I write stuff. I sense Dan, he goes, well, this is just amazing. This is... Oh, blimey. And I think, wow, William, you've written something absolutely incredible there. And then I read it back a, a day later and I just think, oh, this was, this was garbage. Um, and uh, finally, um, just want to thank my mum, uh, who has had the unpaid and thankless task of being my proofreader since my first GCSE essay. Um, the amount of time she must have spent trying to teach me how to hold a pen um, is ridiculous. Um, and I'm very lucky to have two parents who are also my friends. So uh, thank you very much. And just finally, like everyone who's here, like I'm absolutely blown. Like I have to scroll through your pictures to see it. I'm so lucky, like friends from home, colleagues. Um, uh, it's um, oh, Simon actually gave me a wave. Um, like, uh, like people like Rich, Matt and Damien from home. I really appreciate it. So um, thank you all. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been able to thank you all individually, but um, yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll shut up now and let you have your evening. That is a bit like the Oscars there, Will. I know, you should have started playing the music to get rid of me. <laughs> I, I want to add to those thanks, actually, and thanks, Sandra, for leading us through um, this evening so expertly and so um, intelligently as well. Um, and I'm sorry if you asked a question on chat and didn't um, didn't get the chance to have it um, answered. I want to add one question to that, which is to ask Will what it was like to be the interviewee instead of the interviewer. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. I don't get to just choose the bits I write about here. Like if I ask a bad question to a politician, I can just not include that. Whereas uh, here I actually have to. Yeah, I'm, oh, just, I'm in hope. Yeah, well, just bear it in mind then. Eh? Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone. It's been a really interesting night. It's been as interesting as, as reading the latest uh, chapter when it came through from Will. Uh, it's a great book. I urge you all to go and buy it. I recommend it to your friends, particularly in Wales. It has lots of interesting stories, has lots of interesting things to say, lots of important things to say as well. And I'm very proud that Seren's publishing it. <laughs>